Thank you for watching or downloading this sermon. We start a new series in a Belgic Confession. In this series, we seek to summarize the doctrines in Scripture as summarized in a Belgic Confession. This confession is written in 1561 to demonstrate that the Reformed Church is not a sectarian group, but a church that is in line with the ecumenical councils. We hope that you will be edified through this series as we lay out what our church believes. One thing we've learned from the Belgic Confession is that the Lord is a ruler over heaven and earth. This is the assurance that as we are redeemed, as God's redeemed people, that our God is the one who is Lord over all, not only us as redeemed, but the whole heaven and earth. This means he is a king. All mankind is called to worship him, to honor him, but especially us as the redeemed people of God. Now, as we think about the new life that is ours, we are those who are secured in Christ, guaranteed to have life because our Lord has conquered. Uh, We are those who know that we will triumph in Christ, but yet there's still the lingering issue. How do we know we will triumph in Christ? We can hear of all sorts of problems going on around us. We think of Satan. We think of the demons. There's a lot of problems that we potentially face, right? How do we know that our church the church, we ourselves as individuals are going to endure until the end because our God is sovereign enough. How do we know that the Lord isn't able or isn't going to just let up his hand for a moment and in that moment we might fall and falter and then all is left? So how do we know that our Lord is able to endure until the end? Well, I want to simply divide our message into two points. We have man's desire where Joseph addresses his brother with why they sent him away. And lastly, we have God's decree and how God works out his plan of salvation. Let's begin then with man's desire. When we look at man's desire and we look at what man wants to do, we have this understanding that man is one who generally, well, you think about man, and as our, Belgian, our Heidelberg Catechism tells us, man naturally hates God and his neighbor. So what does man naturally desire to do? Man naturally desires to undermine the purposes of God. Uh, this is the problem of the fall. God didn't create man this way, but as a result of the fall, this is a reality where we find ourselves. But there's something else when we think about the problem in the Belgic Confession or what it's uh, raised for us and where our minds can go and the problem that it's seeking to answer now. So it doesn't just raise a problem and then say, well, too bad. It's actually dealing with the next logical place where we will go. And that's the issue of Satan and the demons. Um, If God is one who did not create uh, an enemy because he needed a worthy adversary, What do we do with Satan and the demons? Uh, Because you think about that. It's fallen angels, as we know. They have to answer to the Lord. Uh, Satan had to come before the Lord with Job. Uh, We think about the angels of the glory who haven't fallen. And so there, there are these angelic forces that the Lord keeps in check. Now, there's no doubt, as we look in Job, that Satan comes before the Lord. And as Satan comes before the Lord, uh, the Lord sets the boundaries of Satan. But the issue and the lingering problem comes from Revelation 20, verse 7. It says, in Revelation 20, verse 7, is where the Lord says he's going to release Satan for a time. So if the Lord releases Satan, basically takes him off the leash, seems that Revelation 20, verse 7 is saying at the end of the millennium, Satan's going to have his last hurrah and his ability to rebel against God and to give it all he's got. So how do we know that God will be able to persevere or, or preserve us through this time and, and basically keep Satan in check and be able to uphold his church and us in this process if Satan is released and allowed to just go? Well, this is where the Belgic Confession continues. It wants us to understand the reality of how this works out. I mean, you can look over the internet, you can find theology of Satan being released. You find theology of the demonic army, like we mentioned a couple weeks ago, and how frightening that can be. 
But the Belgic is telling us something we, we need to understand. God is always in control. This is what the Belgic wants to drive home to us. God is always in control. Uh, if Satan is released and it seems God is no longer in control, is that really what our theology teaches? Is that really what scripture teaches? Uh, the assurance that we have is that as God has created all things, God preserves all things. God has made a, a binding uh, covenant, if you will, uh, not only with Adam, but as he uh, enters into his Sabbath rest, he's projecting and making explicit that he will bring this creation to its goal. This means God is saying that every step of the way, God is going to control and order this creation. It's not going to spiral out of his control or out of his power. Now, this is where we come up with the problem of evil. And the problem of evil is basically if God is so sovereign and God is good and, and he is sovereign and he is good, uh, I certainly believe that. Our Belgic Confession teaches that. We're called to believe this reality. But as God has created this world without sin, he's created all things good, and he preserves this thing un un until the end, why is it that there was a fall? Why is it that there is a struggle? And so the reality is, yes, God did create this world without sin, but there is a reality that there is the fall. God allowed the fall to happen. God did not make Adam and Eve fall into sin. And so obviously people can say, well, then how can God hold man accountable? If he could have preserved, if he could have preserved man at the very moment, how is it that man is held accountable uh, to this God? Because after all, he's the one that allowed the fall to happen. Well, first of all, we need to understand God is God. And God is the one who is a just ruler over all things. But when we think about God interacting with mankind, God is the one who continues to uphold this world. As God interacts with his children, who we are, uh, God is the one who does uh, discipline us and lead us, not in the sense that we do this sin and then necessarily there's a, a correlation to that sin like a covenant of works. But like Hebrews tells us in chapter 13, that God is the one who disciplines the ones that he loves. And so what is the purpose of that? Well, it's not that God is trying to harm us or he's trying to uh, basically do a tit-for-tat type of arrangement. But it's actually the point that Hebrews is making in chapter 13 is that God is the one who continues to guide and to lead, and God is the one who continues to wean us off this world. So in terms of God by his providence watching over us, sometimes bringing us to frustrating places where we may not want to be, times of blessing, all these times are orchestrated by the hand of God so that we would come to him, either bow our knees in uh, repentance or maybe just in humility, uh, depending what the Lord is trying to do in that particular moment, or just in absolute thankfulness and being thankful that God is the one who has preserved us until the end. And so as we consider this reality, uh, it's not that God is disciplining us in his providence in the sense of like we see with David. He commits an adulterous sin, and then we have uh, the loss of that child. It's not like what we see with Adam and Eve. They eat of the tree, and they're instantly marched out of the Garden of Eden. When we talk about the providence of God, we talk about uh, this discipline, disciplinary action. Overall, what is God doing? The trajectory of what Hebrews is saying is not that we're under a covenant of works, but that God, by the covenant of grace as he sanctifies us, may sometimes bring us into situations we may not enjoy, but it's to teach us of his goodness, it's to wean us off the hope of this world, and that ultimately we cling to him. Now when people really push this issue of the problem of evil, the reality is, as I know God is good, as I know he is sovereign, I do not know why the Lord ordained the fall. In the goodness and wisdom of God, he decided it was a good thing for him to allow to happen. He didn't make it happen. He didn't make Adam sin. He didn't make Satan sin. Ultimately, I side with the objection that the Apostle Paul uh, gives to the one who raises a similar objection, where he says, if God is the one who holds man accountable, well then, and God's the one who's sovereign over all things, then how can God really be mad at man? 
And this is where the Apostle Paul says in Romans 9, verse 20, Who are you, O man, to talk back to God? And that's the reality of where we need to be. We need to be willing to be submissive to our God and to want to be instructed by him as he cares for us, understanding that he is sovereign and he is ruler over all. Now, as the confession goes through this issue and, and talks about the providence of God, it assures us that we are to be content pupils of Christ. I like that language. In other words, we find our contentment in being instructed by the Lord. This doesn't mean that every lesson we learn in the school of hard knocks is necessarily an enjoyable lesson. It uh, doesn't mean we necessarily enjoy it while it's going on. But the Belgic Confession is saying we are those who are pupils of Christ uh, desiring to learn his will. Second, he says it is the devils and the wicked men who act unjustly. So these are the people who do wrong. Uh, it is not God who makes them do wrong. God certainly ordains what comes to pass. He may allow it to happen. He may actively make it happen. He may allow people to do what they want to do or these demons or devils to do what they want to do. But it's all within the confines of his sovereignty. So when we just generally look at what we read in Revelation 20 verse 7 of Satan being released and we can say, oh my goodness, is God sovereign enough to control him? The answer is yes. Satan is not a worthy rival to the living God. This is why I wanted to turn to a familiar text in Genesis 50. Because here we find an actual evil desire, an evil conspiracy, a conscious conspiracy uh, to, to harm someone and to literally do harm and to destroy someone. And it seems that all hope against hope, the Lord prevails. And this, of course, is the story of Joseph. And the story of Joseph, when you think about this scene here, and why I wanted to read the context of this narrative, is that we have <clears throat> Joseph dead, Joseph's dad, uh, Jacob, uh, Israel, who has died, has been embalmed, and his brothers have sent this false memo uh, to Joseph. It's somewhat comical. Uh, they're they say that their father is the one who gave this command, says, please forgive the transgression of your brothers for their sin because they did evil to you. Um, when, when you read that, you understand what are they doing? Well, they're, they're saying, hey, when your dad dies, you don't want to harm the, the wish of a dying man. Uh, you're, you know, our dad said you, you need to forgive us. That, that's what he said. So notice what, what they're doing here. You have in this story scheming that's always gone on Jacob scheming Esau out of the birthright, Laban, Jacob scheming each other, uh, and, and how you see that working, Jacob finally wrestling with God, etc. Here you see how that family is still giving in to its scheming, that the brothers come together rather than coming before Joseph and saying, hey, we, we understand what we did was wrong, would you forgive us? No, the, the brothers don't do that. They come up with this plan uh, to make sure that Joseph will ultimately uh, forgive them. Because obviously they're still troubled by this, even though we can see that Joseph has certainly moved beyond it. But there are some things that we notice with their assumption. Uh, the main thing is that they don't have any assumption that the Holy Spirit is still working in Joseph. Uh, they think that they need to do this scheme uh, because the Lord can't work on Joseph. Joseph hasn't learned anything uh, in his experience of the school of hard knocks by the providence of God. But also, secondly, that they are those who believe uh, that their manipulation and their schemes are going to ultimately bring about uh, the their life and their preservation rather than the Lord. And we may say, well, this is just a problem with the brothers. But there's this assurance that Joseph has here. What they decided to, to do for evil and to harm him, God meant for good. What is it that is meant by evil? Well, this family characterized by competition, sibling rivalry, uh, we see a lot of scheming that's gone on, which is why Jacob ultimately had to leave his home, uh, that he was sent away. We have the unfavored children who have sent Joseph away, uh, Genesis 37, 21. Uh, it is Reuben who desires to throw uh, Joseph in a pit, uh, even though the brothers conspired to kill him. And Reuben wants to do this so he can ultimately sneak Joseph out. Now, what's he going to do after he sneaks him out of the pit? 
we don't know. He's probably going to tell him that it's wise for him uh, to get out of town because the brothers are going to kill him, and this is probably the only time he's going to receive mercy. That would be my speculation as to what he's trying to do. But whatever the case, we know that Reuben uh, wanted to put him in the pit so he's again scheming against the brothers and scheming to try and save his brother so they don't kill him. But it's Judah that actually comes up with the plan. And again, in the line of the Lord, uh, you think of Judah in the line of David, who says, hey, there's these Ishmaelites coming. Why would we kill our brother? If we kill our brother, that's not profitable for us. He just dies. Why not go for a win-win? Sell him to the Ishmaelites. Again, the very enemies of the gospel or covenant line. They're, they're the ones that are sent out by Abraham. Uh, they're not the ones that are part of the seed of the woman in terms of the hard lineage that's going on there in, in terms of the typology in Genesis. So basically they're saying, let's sell him to the enemy because if they sell him to the enemy, then the enemy will probably do what we don't want to do. Uh, the blood's off our hands. We get rid of our brother, and we make some money on the side. So at the end of the day, they accomplish all their goals uh, without having to get their hands dirty in the process. And so they end up selling their brother uh, with the intent of harming their brother, getting rid of their brother. Uh, there's no way they expected their brother to rise to the position where he is in Egypt. And so you, you, you go back in that history, and you see, yes, what Joseph is saying, he's not overstating his case. The brothers meant evil against him. So where the sermon started in terms of evil, in terms of Satan running rampant, and whether God's able to accomplish his mission, yes, I mean, here, all hope against hope. Joseph should not be alive. Uh, human expectation is he probably would have died in slavery. Maybe the Ishmaelites, when they figured out ultimately who he was, uh, they would probably treat him horrible and maybe uh, push him to the point where he just exhausts himself and dies. Uh, they, they don't have any affection or care for him. Uh, but nevertheless, we find clearly, in the context of the brothers, clearly intending to do evil. Even Reuben, in his best intentions of delivering his brother, we find that in their, in their fundamental intentions... They want to harm their brother. Now, what does Joseph learn from all this? And it's important because it's really not about Joseph, but it's what Joseph comes to realize in the plan of God. And he calls attention to the sovereign will. So notice how we said, you know, Romans 9, verse 20, who are you, a man, to talk back to God? His brothers come up with this scheme. And Joseph sees right through their ruse. He, he looks at this trickery and goes, come on, guys. I'm not that stupid. I wasn't born yesterday. If dad really said this, dad would have said it to me. He wouldn't have sent a memo. You don't need to engage in this trickery and this deception. It's, it's not necessary. I'm not in the place of God. And so what Joseph is saying is it's not about my will. It's not about my desires. Even if I wanted to get vengeance on you, I'm not in a position to do that because I'm not in the place of God. I see what God has done. So what has God done uh, for Joseph in terms of, of his life here? Well, uh, Joseph is one who is actually second in command under Pharaoh. So his brothers obviously take note of that and say, wait a minute, uh, Joseph is in a position where he can give a command and he has people uh, to actually execute. So like the brothers, sell him to the Ishmaelites, they'll probably take care of the problem for us and do what we want anyway, so we'll just wipe our hands clean. See, now Joseph could do the same thing. He could turn and say, well, we'll just send the brothers or, or we'll just, you know, send someone else to take care of the brothers. And so that way I'm not the one who actually did it. I just told someone to do it. So you can see where the brothers think, well, Joseph's probably thinking this. Joseph's saying, listen, even if I wanted to, I'm not in a place of God. That's not on the table. That's not my option. I've moved beyond this and understand who God is, and I desire to please him. And so how has he understood who God is? Does this mean that he's just uh, walked into this time of lecture and it's been easy? Well, no, if you actually trace the story of Joseph's life, he's a guy who got himself in a lot of trouble doing the right thing. Uh, first of all, uh, as he's carried off by the Ishmaelites, he gets sold in Egypt, he ends up uh, serving in Potiphar's household. He's in a, a good place. 
uh, Potiphar's wife uh, propositions him and, and desires to have an affair with him. Uh, Joseph says, hey, uh, this is not what Potiphar allows. He's given me his household. He's withheld you. Uh, I'm not giving in to this. He runs away. She grabs his jacket. As a result of this, the jacket that got him into trouble with his brothers, remember uh, his dad giving him the coat of many colors, now again Joseph's cloak gets him into trouble, and she uses this as evidence. She accuses him, says here's a, a young Hebrew who desires to mock us, how dare he, and so he is sent into prison. Now prison's pretty bad, but yet Joseph does pretty well in prison. You find that you know, he still finds favor. He's kept in a cell with a cupbearer, and he's kept in, cell, in a cell with, uh, with the chief baker. The cupbearer has a dream, and he dreams that there are three branches, and Joseph then uh, talks to him about what's going on with this dream in these three branches, and he says, hey, in three days, uh, you're going to be lifted up. Uh, Pharaoh's going to lift you up, and then you're going to be lifted out of prison, and everything's going to be fine. Well, the baker hears this as, wow, this is great. You know, this dream is favorable. I also had something uh, with these uh, three things going on. Well, Joseph tells him, well, actually what's going to happen is in three days, uh, you're going to have your head lifted off your body. You're, you're going to be hung. So you're going to be lifted up as well, but not lifted up in the sense of an exalted place, but you're going to be hung. And so uh, these men hear this interpretation and the baker is one who probably should have quit while he was ahead and not asked Joseph to interpret the dream. But nevertheless, as the narrative goes on, we find that Joseph asks the cupbearer to remember him. So Joseph's confident in his dream. He says, the Lord said so. Joseph knows that the Lord is going to do this. Uh, the problem is that the cupbearer doesn't remember Joseph. He's restored, and as he's restored to his place, Joseph is left in prison. There's something that the text tells us in verses 14 and 15, that it says, uh, and I believe it's chapter 37, or it's where Joseph interprets the dream, and as he interprets the dream, uh, we have <clears throat> Joseph putting his confidence in the cupbearer because he's putting his hope in this cupbearer being restored. And he says, as this cupbearer is going to be restored, he's saying, uh, remember me. So where is he putting his hope? He's not putting his hope in the Lord. He's putting his hope in the cupbearer. And so as a problem here, the Lord allows him to stay in prison uh, for two more years. As he stays in prison, we have all of a sudden, Pharaoh has this dream. And so, yes, it's 40 uh, verses 14 and 15. We have in 41 verse 1, where all of a sudden Pharaoh has a strange dream that keeps him awake. And as Pharaoh has this dream, there are these cows. So you have these seven fat cows, you have these seven lean cows that eat up the fat cows, and he doesn't know what to do with this. Uh, all the wise men try to interpret the dream, they don't know what to do with this. So finally, as Pharaoh is, is perplexed by this, the cupbearer remembers in 41 verse 9, he says, oh, today I remember my offenses. Now again, it's not about the cupbearer remembering his offenses. It's about the Lord, again, working by his providence. So as Joseph is still in prison, uh, Pharaoh sends for him, he comes up, he hears uh, about this dream, he says, oh, well, here's the interpretation. You're going to have seven fat years, seven lean years. We'll swallow up the fat years. Um, and as a result of this, uh, we need to exercise some wisdom. So what does Joseph do? He says, well, during the seven fat years, the years of blessing, let's take these years of blessing and let's store up uh, the excess. And as we store up the excess, uh, you find that people uh, are those that, you know, they celebrate. They're, they're happy. This is great because when the famine comes, all of a sudden, there's people that are coming from many nations. Uh, members of the empire or the, um, of, of Egypt end up selling uh, things to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh ends up basically taking possession of all their property and becomes one who is very wealthy. He's a very wealthy man. Joseph is then second in command. And now, in, in terms of this, there, there becomes a tension in the story. Because as the story develops, and Joseph is one who moves to this position, 
Uh, Pharaoh restores him, makes him second in command. Joseph oversees the land. This is where he ends up interacting with his brothers, and basically it seems he interviews people who come from other, other lands and other nations who are trying to get this food. Well, Pharaoh ends up giving him a Potiphar's daughter, or Potiphar, however that arrangement works out, uh, gives him a daughter. This is basically a priest, a priest's daughter. He marries into a pagan priestly line. This is from the sun god, Ray. And the concern now we can say is, well, what about Jacob's family? What's happening to Joseph? Here he's a guy who uh, made it to the top. He was in Potiphar's house, ends up uh, in prison. Uh, he's forgotten for two years. One wonders, is there bitterness? A cupbearer doesn't remember him. The Lord does give him the vision. But is Joseph going to fundamentally remember who the Lord is. Uh, has God taught him to wait upon the Lord and to not trust in man? Has the Lord made clear to Joseph, and has Joseph truly learned that one needs to trust in, in who God is and the protection of the Lord being the shield and defender, or is Joseph turning to something else? Well, we don't wait very long because we find that this Egyptian wife coming from the pagan priestly line gives Joseph two children. There is Manasseh, which means, for God has made me forget all the hardships in all my father's house. So the reality is, Joseph is saying, uh, the Lord has basically brought me to a place where I don't remember what I've been through. It's gone. I've moved beyond it. Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The significance of this is that Joseph is now moving completely beyond self, moving completely beyond everything he's experienced, and where does he put his hope? And that the Lord is the one who has watched over him. The Lord has preserved him, even when it seemed like he was forgotten in prison, even when the cupbearer literally forgot about him. The Lord has always remembered him. And that's what Joseph has learned through his uh, school of hard knocks and his sanctifying process by the Lord that the Lord is faithful. The Lord has remembered him and watched over him. And so the Lord then does not forget his goodness. Joseph does not forget the sweetness of his God. He may forget the hardships he's been through, but he remembers the sweetness of his God. And so then the Lord has this fundamental desire that we continue on to see the will of God. Because even Jacob, his father, has had his issues. And as Jacob had to travel to the land of Canaan and had to uh, journey here uh, after a series of, of things that Joseph did to test his brothers to make sure his brother Benjamin's still alive, when he gets confirmation, the whole family moves over to Egypt. And this brings us to a place where Jacob is about to die. And it's in Genesis 48 that as Jacob is about to die, um, Joseph brings his sons Ephraim and Manasseh to his father, Jacob. Now keep in mind, Jacob's one who has pursued the promises of God with his zeal, with his scheming, has always tried to bring in the promises of God through his flesh, and the Lord has always frustrated those efforts. It's not until Jacob finally wrestles with God that he comes to realize that the strength of the kingdom is manifested uh, through his weakness when the Lord simply touches his hip. It's where he becomes Israel. I've wrestled, I've prevailed and he walks with a limp for the remainder of his life. So now we have this scenario where Joseph, that we see here in Genesis 50, says, I'm not in the place of God, I, I can't judge you. He brings his son over to his father, who has always pursued the promises of God by his own strength, his own scheming, his own fleshly works. And now we, we have this strange situation, whereas his father is blind, not seeing well, he's, he's old, uh, much like his father, uh, Isaac, where he gets old, and then we have that ruse that goes on. So you wonder, well, have the patriarchs moved beyond this? Have they really understood uh, the plan and promises of God? Well, Joseph brings his sons there. You have Ephraim, you have Manasseh. You have Manasseh, who's the oldest, Ephraim, who's the youngest. And he takes Jacob's hands and you know, he takes his right hand, puts it on Manasseh's head, takes his left hand, puts it on Ephraim's head. 
because Manasseh, the older one, is supposed to receive the greater blessing and Ephraim is supposed to see it receive the lesser blessing. So in terms of this, you think, okay, well, this makes sense. But all of a sudden, we have Jacob crossing his hands. Israel crosses his hands. So now you're going to have the younger receive the right-handed blessing and the older receive the left-handed blessing. And, and you might wonder, why is he doing this? And he gives this wonderful blessing. He says, The God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on, the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. The point of this is that they would not uh, find the legacy in the family, but is that fundamentally he wants the patriarchal tradition to continue. What is that tradition? Is that tradition of understanding the promises of God being worked out in a community, the promises of God not coming about through the schemes of men, but the promises of God happening only by the blessing of the living God. And so in summary then, when Joseph comes before his brothers and he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He says, so do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. That here is not Joseph patting himself on the back, but is Joseph saying, do you understand that the Lord has placed me here as a means of redemption? I'm not in a place of, of triumphing over you and bringing about justice because that's not my place. I'm one who has gone through the school of hard knocks. God, by his grace and mercy, has taught me his provision and his care. And he's communicating this with the assurance that's given to his brothers. That as the Lord is the one who has done this, Joseph is saying as a means of redemption, here I am lifted up as the one who gives life. What is this ultimately pointing to? Well, it's pointing to Christ as the one who ultimately humbles himself to a point of death, one who is despised, one who is forgotten, one who is ignored, uh, one who is abandoned to all of a sudden be the one who rises to give life and to give abundance. This is what Joseph is ultimately pointing to and reminding his brothers. And when we think about then the plan of God, and what the Belgic Confession is teaching us. It's giving us the assurance that no matter what we face, our Lord is a sovereign God. Our Lord will bring about his redemptive blessings as the Lord desires to bring about these redemptive blessings. They are established and are established in Christ. And it means that those that the Lord has determined to receive these blessings will receive these blessings. It means that as we walk under the sun and we sojourn throughout this age, God will remember his promises. He will be a shield and defender. He will protect and preserve his people no matter what we face. You think Joseph, when he's in prison, forgotten, is one who really believes that he's going to end up in the second position of power in Egypt? Certainly, I'm sure he had his doubts and he had his struggles. But at the end of the day, he still understood, the Lord will see me through this. And here the Lord did indeed see him through it to the point where his brothers assume that Joseph will take out vengeance upon them without understanding the essence of the gospel promise, that the Lord is the one who takes away our offenses, endures and takes our iniquities, and gives us his righteousness and his goodness so that we can have life and have it abundantly in him. So in conclusion, there's no doubt there are powers out there that seek to harm us. There's no doubt there are forces and people that desire to do us harm. However, there's something we need to remember when we ask that question. Will the Lord's church endure to the end? Can God preserve us until the end? Well, we know from this brief snapshot that the brothers of Joseph fundamentally desired to harm Joseph. They didn't mean anything for good. They desired his ultimate and definitive demise. If God 
can do this with one of his children prior to the advent of Christ, merely under a promise, how much more assured ought we to be today that our Lord is able to preserve us until the end? This is the assurance of the Lord being a shield and defender. Is Joseph the one who's our ultimate hope? Well, of course not. Our ultimate hope is knowing that it is Christ who has passed into the pit and belly of death, hell itself, and has emerged triumphant. As we find our hope and our assurance in Christ, we know that there is nothing we have to fear. For our Lord has redeemed, he has secured, he has made us alive. Let us then find our hope and our lives in the Lord as his redeemed people. Let us believe that as the Lord says, he is our shield and defender, he is our shield and defender. He will uphold us until the end. Why? Because Christ has prevailed. And because Christ prevailed, it's Joseph who prevails. And as Joseph prevails, the irony is, the very family of Joseph that sought to destroy him found their life in him. What a wonderful presentation, the Pentecost sermon with Peter. When they're cut to the heart, the very individuals who say, oh, but what do we do? We're the ones that sent him to the cross. Peter says, repent and be baptized. And it's the assurance that as they repent and they are baptized or identified as the children of the living God and take hold of Christ by faith, they have nothing to fear. Because as they take hold of Christ by faith, they know that it's the Spirit that's at work in them, conforming them to their Lord and to our Lord. Let us then continue to have the confidence that our Lord will preserve us. Let us have the confidence that no matter what we see, no matter what our eyes perceive, our Lord will preserve us until the end because he is our shield and defender. Let us then continually give ourselves over to his spirit. Let us walk by faith and let us desire then to conform to his revealed will for he is a God who is able to accomplish what he has set out to do. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, Reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.